Uh, my name is Renee Lynch. I'm an assistant uh, food editor at the LA Times. I put my email address up here because I need to hightail it out of here right after the meeting, uh, after the panel. Um, but if you have any questions or any follow-up for me, feel free to, uh, to contact me. I just don't have much time right after, but I'm happy to talk about anything that you might uh, you might want to talk about. Journalists are kind of like freaks, so if you want to bounce an idea off me, I can't run off with it or tell anybody else about it. So sometimes people like to run some ideas by. So. But uh, enough about me. The stars today are really our panelists here. Um, we're going to um, briefly go down the panel. They will introduce themselves um, and tell you a little bit about how their businesses have grown, what they started with, and what they're at now. Um, but what we want to do is we really want to open it up to questions and make sure that all of your questions have been answered. I can interview these guys for five hours. We want to make sure that your questions get answered. <coughs> Don't hesitate to ask anything. This is your opportunity to really kind of bounce an idea off experts in the field. Um, so take advantage of that. Um, so why don't we start? If you want to, oh, oh, before we do, I want you to pay attention as you go down the, the panel. These, this is a great cross section. You have different types of, of, um, of, uh, of fair. You have different types of approaches. You have really high end dining, nightclub action. You have Mexican, Asian. I mean, you really people have gone about this in totally different ways, and I want you to walk away with the inspiration that there's no one single path to success. There are many different paths to success. So just keep that in mind as you hear as you hear what these guys have to say. So why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and where you started and where your business is at now. Um, we started in 1984. Um, I've been uh, working in the corporate restaurant industry for quite some time um, and was about to put on the golden handcuffs and I decided that I would go branch out on my own. Uh, I had uh, $2,500 to my name. I borrowed about another $8,000 and had a contractor take, uh, do the, all the work on credit and got the first book the Mas open for $11,000. Uh, I don't think I could do that again. Um, I, I'm positive I can't do that again. Um, and uh, so we opened the first restaurant. The second two were opened with uh, cash flow and credit cards. Uh, and uh, I gave up a nice apartment when I first started uh, and lived in a converted garage for about a year and a half because I didn't really see where I was living anyway because I was only at the restaurant except for the four hours to go home and sleep and, and shower, which is what every every restaurant tour does. And then uh, Br briefly had a stint with some investors to open up more stores, ended up buying them out and um, uh, just bringing everything back to myself. We have five company stores now, seven franchise stores. The franchise started because we had some employees that have been with us for quite a long time and I wanted to give them an opportunity to grow and so we've got several franchise locations from different uh, uh, employees plus a couple of corporate uh, locations. Uh, and that's uh, where we're at today. We're a total of 12 restaurants. Describe uh, Bukit Tomas for somebody who maybe hasn't had the pleasure of having those tor fresh tortillas. Well, okay, we have, a, our slogan is we don't serve fast food, we serve fresh food as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, we basically start with scratch every day, every salsa, every tortilla, everything we, except for the chips which we buy because there's, there's too many to make. And we start from scratch every day, make the food, and if we're not using it that night, uh, Hopefully we're pretty good at, at not having to throw stuff away, but we start fresh with uh, new product every single day. Uh, we make batch cooking for some of our items, and if we run out, uh, we sell out of carnitas, we sell out of carnitas. We, we, we try to keep everything as fresh as possible, and, and we're, you know, we look for better ways to improve. And you know, over the 20, almost seven years now, we're, finding, we're still finding ways to improve. Lee? Um, I opened up my first uh, bar lounge nightclub in 95, actually while I was a student right here, and uh, while everyone was in class listening to uh, the genius professor, I was actually in the hallway on the phone trying to make deals and open up my own business, which I, which I do recommend. Um, <laughs> thank God for those groups that you have when you're in school. Um, when I got out of school, uh, we had this nightclub and decided, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to go into consulting or banking like everyone else was in my class? And uh, or do this entrepreneurial thing, which now I had the bug, and I realized that you know what you make is up to you at this point. And we opened up the first sushi roku restaurant uh, about a year later, 14 years ago, and we opened that up for about $650,000. You know, friends and family. Although we didn't go to family because we didn't want to lose our money, but we basically begged people to invest with us, and, and they invested not in the concept because what does uh, some white guy know about Japanese food? But they knew that 
myself and my partners would work our asses off and make this make this work. And uh, they did, and and we started paying them back right away, and we paid back our investors in 13 months. And what went from the hardest thing to do, which was raise money, became the easiest thing to do until oh nine actually. But um, so now we have uh, 13 restaurants, six different brands: uh, Sushiroku, Katana, and Boa Steakhouse. You might see on Team Z, unfortunately. Um, and some others, and we are in uh, LA, Las Vegas, Scotts, Arizona, and we took uh, a year off of developing given the economy, and now we're, we're full force again. We're working on many deals right now, and we're the first restaurant that cost 650 to build, and now the next restaurant costs 6 million. And uh, you know, things just get bigger and bigger as you go, but uh, you know, we love what we do, and I definitely recommend the, uh, the entrepreneurial way. Great. Uh, Likely, I was uh, Anderson, class of 96, and uh, also likely I started a business while I was a uh, student here. Uh, my business was an e-commerce development company, and uh, so my background was technology. I went to MIT undergrad and had the entrepreneurial bug, and uh, uh, back then the, uh, uh, the internet was just emerging, and so I saw the opportunity and uh, jumped on it and ended up uh, uh, develop developing a pretty successful company uh, that grew quite a bit, and I uh, was lucky enough to sell sell a piece of it at the right time, and uh, in 2004, I sold that business completely. And uh, basically had a blank slate, I was trying to figure out what to do next. And uh, one of the things that always bugged me personally was, I was, health, I was health conscious, I wasn't vegetarian at the time, but just had a tough time trying to find wholesome, delicious, convenient food. I just wasn't happy with my choices. And uh, it just kind of bugged me, and I read something in the LA Business Journal that the 10 largest franchisees in LA were all pizza companies, and just wondering you know, why, why isn't there something that's convenient, delicious, and wholesome? And it uh, bugged me enough that I started doing research with a partner in the market, and uh, ended up determining that, hey, there's a lot of people who want better quality choices out there, and uh, with the growth of Whole Foods, and uh, and the uh, consumer research out there, people were unhappy with their fast food choices, and so decided there was a real need for it. We weren't alone. People really wanted better choices. Uh, so then, took it bottom up. Uh, myself and my partner did not have a restaurant background. So we ended up uh, uh, doing as much, much research as we could. Visited every quote unquote healthy restaurant around uh, Southern California, New York, <coughs> Chicago, and uh, ended up at a lot of vegetarian restaurants. And uh, we ended up being very, very surprised at what you could do with veggie proteins, with these veggie protein specialties, when you use the right marinades and sauces. Uh, we were amazed at how good they could be. And, uh, and so we got very excited about the fact that, that you know, these types of proteins, when you use the right marinades and sauces, you could actually create classic American sandwiches and burgers, um, like the Santa Fe crispy chicken, uh, Chipotle barbecue sandwich, and people come to our restaurant, like, they, they don't know it's not chicken, and, and they're amazed that it isn't. And, uh, and so we became very passionate about the need and the opportunity and also the benefits from the food. Along the way, we, we did the research on plant-based foods, and we became uh, vegetarian and uh, adopted that diet and uh, had great results ourselves. We lost weight uh, and uh, just felt great. And so uh, we really developed a passion to jump into the restaurant business, which is kind of crazy for a couple guys who had never been in it. And, uh, Super uh, crazy. Yeah, they said the best way to make a million dollars in the restaurant business is to start with two. So, uh, <laughs> we were right on that path, but uh, lucky enough we did, uh, we did recruit a third partner who uh, we found during our research who we thought was doing the best job around with these, uh, these proteins and uh, talked to him about our vision of taking this, this food that was really more of a niche type food and you had to be, really it was only the vegetarians and the vegans that were out there seeking it out and finding it and it wasn't approachable, it wasn't convenient uh, and uh, we saw the opportunity to, just like we had discovered it, to take this type of food and uh, bring it to a much larger audience and, uh, and so that was our, our vision and our third partner, uh, Ray White, uh, came on board as well. Uh, as our food partner, and he embraced that vision as well. He, he just wanted to create great food for uh, a mainstream audience, and we set out to be the whole food of the restaurant industry. And, uh, and we did a lot of work on the branding and the overall menu and trying to make it as fun, friendly, and approachable as we can, as we could, and really get over the vegetarian stereotype, because that was our biggest fear, that uh, people would just 
hear the veggie grill and think tofu and sprouts. And so we really worked as hard as we could on trying to just get people to give us a try and get people when they walked in to say, all right, I'll give it a try. Looks, looks, looks okay. I got Santa Fe crispy chicken. I got sweet potato fries. Uh, how, how bad could it be? And uh, so, uh, so we, we, we put the money in. We uh, did everything we needed to do to get that first restaurant open. It cost about a million dollars to get the first one open and uh, all our own. <coughs> Capital and uh, opened the doors, and uh, lucky enough, uh, people people really embraced it. We launched the first one in November 2006, uh, right across from UC Irvine, and uh, uh, that one, uh, lucky enough, uh, did great. And uh, we were voted best new restaurant in Orange County in 2007 uh, in the OC Register, and uh, so that gave us the wherewithal to really take this concept and, and grow it. And so uh, uh, we're now going to open our seventh. Uh, next week, and so uh, uh, we feel pretty lucky. So I uh, I started uh, as a chef, spent many many years working uh, at some of the top tables in the, in the country. Um, after spending a lot of time up in San Francisco, <laughs> I moved down to LA to head up uh, the stoves at Shutters on the Beach, where I met my partners. And what I found in in LA, particularly Santa Monica, was uh, there were great A-list centric restaurants, um, and there were a lot of really mediocre, uh, affordable restaurants, and nothing in the middle. And I found myself uh, sort of wandering around looking for something to eat on my day off, and ended up at the farmers market, Whole Foods, Santa Monica Seafood. Um, taking the time to shop, bringing it home, inviting people over, and doing it myself. Um, in a busy world, there's not a lot of time for that. It takes, uh, once you navigate traffic, the parking lot at Whole Foods or the farmer's market, uh, you've already killed two hours and you have to cook. And not everybody takes with the efficiency, maybe, that I do. Um, and then you have to clean at the end of the night. Uh, after a few bottles of wine, that's uh, that's not an interesting task. It's even uh, worse the morning after with the hangover, exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. And to get out of a place like Whole Foods, um, you know, it's, it's not cheap, especially if you don't have your vinegars and olive oils and what have you. So I started to, to think it was time to, to jump off the cliff and hope, hope my parachute would, uh, would open. And I pulled uh, two of my, my partners with me who were at Shutters on the Beach at the time. And, uh, and we leveraged uh, the positions at Shutters to collect friends, family, and some, uh, some colleagues who more than the idea invested in, in us and our ability to, to, to make good on, on what we were promising. Um, and we took a, a menu and a, and a brief overview up to Oxnard and pitched it to Scarborough Farms right, because we really wanted uh, tender greens to be a farm to fork concept long before uh, it had become sort of it's sort of a cliche term now, uh, but seven years ago uh, it wasn't it wasn't common terminology, and the idea was to create a space that was uh, was comfortable comfortable enough that you felt as though you were in your house, um, affordable enough. So everybody had access and sophisticated enough so that I would be comfortable eating there or my partners or the, the, the people that we had catered to over the years in, in the luxury market uh, would be inspired enough and, and they would see the value and the quality. So it took us about two years to raise the capital and there were many, many times when we were ready to pull the plug uh, we stayed employed, stayed uh, working at Shutters, and very much under the radar. And it's hard to get the idea out there when you're, you know, you're you're still working. Um, but we managed to do that, and finally we raised enough money uh, to start shopping for a location. We were lucky enough to find a very good deal in Culver City before Culver City was was anything. Uh, you know, they had twinkle lights and, and empty parking lots and, and a movie theater and certainly pictures, but nobody was really paying attention to it, uh, which is why we got in as a startup uh, no-name. 
and fortunately enough, we, we opened with about $8,000 left in the bank account and a lot, of, uh, a lot of bills coming in. And we were lucky enough to get a daily candy post day one. Uh, we had a line out the door uh, from the moment we started till the moment we closed the doors. We actually closed early the first day because we ran out of food and energy. Um, retooled and off we, you know, off we were. And uh, you know, now five years later, we I just opened our fifth store up in uh, Walnut Creek, up in Northern California. We're up in Pasadena and Santa Monica, and we'll see where that goes. So why don't we start with uh, start with questions from the audience? How about it? I have a question about how to go about getting candy. <coughs> profitable restaurant set that is already working for let's say two or three years. What's the ideal way to get the capital to actually start opening a few more restaurants? You already have one or? So I already have a one restaurant that's been going in operation for like three years. It's profitable, cash flow positive, the concept is well accepted in the society. But my toughest thing is to find the capital out there, find the right kind of people who are actually interested in the concept. I mean, there's yeah, there's really two kinds of financing you can do. One is equity from, from investors, private investors, but there's also what's called ff &E financing or sale leaseback financing. And that went away a couple of years ago, but it's coming back now. Companies like uh, GE Capital, and what they'll do is they'll buy all of your um, <coughs> ff &E, so your kitchen equipment, tables, chairs, whatnot, and then you lease it back from them at an interest rate over five years, and it's a fully amortized loan. And <coughs> so that would take care of a big portion of your, your build out, and then you need the investors for you know, pre-opening and soft costs and whatnot. Um, you, know, you do need to do a personal guarantee for that kind of financing, so you have to be sure what you're doing. And it's uh, not as easy to get as it once was, where they just basically, you sign on the line. Now it's like, you know, you know give me your blood. So um, that's one way, and then, uh, you know, investors-wise, you know, start with your friends and network and, and people that come to your restaurant, I don't know if it's yours or someone else's, but people that come to the restaurant and just, you know, you got to just sell them, sell them a story. Hi, my name is Val, I'm my co-founder, uh, co Talia, but we just had uh, two questions, really. The first is, um, I guess, as restaurateurs, um, how do you guys feel about these sites like Groupon, Living Social, and other... I guess social commerce sites focused on um, food, and then the second question is: If you do use those, or if you have used have used those, um, you know which ones do you like and why? We don't coupon. Uh, it's just a company philosophy we started with. We'll we'll never coupon. Uh, so uh, we're looking for other ways to use the uh, emerging media as a way to sort of reward our customers. But we don't coupon. Uh, I have never used the coupon or the other ones. Uh, if anybody else here has, they may have a better thing. It, uh, why, it, why that philosophy? No coupons. Uh, two reasons. One is we keep our prices pretty pretty tight, uh, and if we start couponing. You know, we're losing money when we sell something. So we're trying to keep a, a, a coupon mentality uh, 365 days a year, uh, and I think that the, the couponing diminishes our brand. Uh, it may work for other brands, but for our brand, I think it diminishes it. And I think that once you get into the coupon um, psyche, then it's very difficult from my sister who taught couponing at, at school uh, to, to different people. That what, it's a different, may not be the group of people that uh, would come back to our restaurant unless they had a coupon. And so we're looking for the organic people that, that are coming to our restaurant for the food and for the atmosphere and the service. And then we're looking for opportunities to reward them for doing so. I would, I would echo that. I, I think if, if you have to discount and you have to run deals and you have the wrong business model, uh, your, your pricing is off, you're not delivering daily val value, um, and, you, and you're losing sight of what your core customer is. Yeah, we take the exact same approach at the Veggie Group. It's about high quality food, as affordable and convenient as we can make it, and uh, we don't want to do anything outside of that. We, um, you know, there's pros and cons to it, and, and we're the type of restaurant in LA that would never do that. But then you have a restaurant like we have in Scottsdale, Arizona, and if anyone knows what's going on there, it's probably one of the worst economies in the country. So I have a 6,000 square foot restaurant with $35,000 a month rent and empty seats. 
So we did a calculation, and you know, I can put an ad in a magazine to attract new people and, and spend money on that, and people maybe see it, maybe don't. Or you can do something like Groupon, where someone actually buys into it and they really want to come. Yes, they might be someone who's just going to do it for the discount, but they also might be someone that you went over for the future that may never have come before. So, you know, we do try things like that for the interest of it, or we've done guilt, like we're the first ones to do Guilt City, and um, you know, it's actually pretty good as long as you're not taking up a seat that would have been taken. Otherwise, that's the big analysis you have to do. Thank you. So um, can the panelists speak a little bit to what they see as the strengths, weaknesses, and staying power of the food truck phenomenon? Where you guys get Who wants to go on that? You know, I, when I went to college, that's how we eat in Philadelphia on campus. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, in places like Santa Monica, you don't have street food. You have you have very expensive, <coughs> tourist-centric and, and expense account restaurants, and then you've got all the clutter, and, and oftentimes not a lot in, in the middle. And it's changing, right? We're, we're, we're changing that. But, uh, you know, I, I think the food truck has, has, a, has a place in the market, but if you've been to Attic Kinney, or if, if you've been to, uh, you know, the LACMA recently, where there are a dozen maybe <coughs> two dozen food trucks. Um, I, I think the barriers to entry for in that business uh, are so low that everybody's getting in into it and it's, it's got they've got to cannibalize themselves at some point. I think there will be a place, but I think it's that's already sliding. I think that they're not going away. Uh, I, I think that the flush out will be in the next two or three years. The gourmet trucks now that we you know they they've completely changed the nomenclature. It used to be called something else. And now it's called a, a, a gourmet food truck. And I think that's been a very successful thing. I don't think it's going away. I think the biggest trouble trucks are going to have is speed, you know, and, and the speed of service. Because, you know, and lots of times you're in a truck, you see a long line, and, but the long line is sometimes because of speed of service. And, and, uh, and I think it looks good, but I think that that's going to be their biggest challenge to come up with a product that they can get out hot, fresh, good, and, and clean in a very quick, fast way. Because I think that. Uh, at this point, um, most restaurants beat them time-wise, and and if they're convenient because they're in a location maybe where other restaurants aren't, they're, they're, they have no competition. So I think that you're going to see them around for a long time. I think you'll see them competing uh, uh, forever. It's, it's 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 a lucrative thing if you if you know what you do. I would uh, echo that, just like the restaurant business, uh, the food truck business. At this point, you got to be really, really, really good at what you do because there's a lot of competition. Yeah. I want to ask a panel regarding when you build your business, but you have a lot of restaurant portfolio, think about Lee. Are you going to do corporate own or franchise? Also, I saw you have a lot of portfolio. Is it too much for you? Or you, you or, or your company is more like doing always develop new concepts, so you just sell all your um, product to the other big company. You know, our plan changes. You know, year by year. Sometimes, sometimes we're saying, okay, we just want to build more bows or more sushi rokus because then you have something to monetize one day. Um, but sometimes you find a location that you just fall in love with, and you're like, what am I going to do with this location? You have to come up with something new. Um, we've never franchised or actually we just did license. We're opening up a uh, a B Grill, which is a boa cafe at the airport at, at United Airlines. So that's a licensing deal where you know we're going to set it up, design it, train them, and then someone else runs it. Um, we're looking at licensing deals in London and, and places that are too far for us to go. I would never franchise or license somewhere that's you know, you know, six hour flight away, let's say. Okay. But I, I noticed you have a lot of portfolio, so are you doing a lot of development with this uh, restaurant concept or you actually own it and you build, build it and actually you also own the real estate? That's my particular question. Do you own the real estate or just you are restaurant? No, we, we normally lease the real estate. And we, we lease a space that's either been a restaurant or hasn't been a restaurant, and then we spend all the money to fix it up or redesign it, and then we have a you know twenty year lease. Thank you. Um, this question is particularly for TK. Um, I love how the veggie grill looks, and it sounds like neither you nor either of your partners had a background in interior design. I was wondering if there were any surprising ways that you came up with the interior. Thanks for the, uh, the love. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I would say uh, what we did, which I think really was to our benefit, uh, is we spent a lot of time uh, defining what our brand was about uh, in terms of clean, crisp, contemporary, 
fun, friendly, familiar. And those were kind of the key words uh, that we gave to our uh, our architect. And uh, and then to their credit, they brought it to life. But we really spent a lot of time defining the core attributes that we wanted reflected in everything that we did. And and one big part of that is the ambiance of, of the actual location. But you didn't take you didn't listen to the architect on every single point. You had also had some ideas that you wanted to follow through, and you actually ended up disagreeing with the architect on some points, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Because he had such a clear vision of what he wanted, that even though the experts were saying X, he was like, another idea here. Is that right? Well, the, uh, yeah, well, I mean, what's happened, you asked, I think the question was, what have you learned over mm -hmm. time? And uh, it's one of the things we've learned over time is, you know, the architects and the designers, they look at everything from their perspective. and. Uh, and so you really have to have that real understanding of who you are, what you're trying to be, and make sure whatever they are recommending goes through that filter. And uh, uh, so as we've grown, there's things that we've done previously. I said, yeah, we spent a lot of money on that. Does that really help us be who we are? And the architects really recommended it. Uh, but we said, you know, we don't need that anymore. And Do you have any examples? Uh, you know, there's the, you know, one location, we, we moved a wall to create a, a, a little patio on the front, and the, the architect thought it would, uh, really it was important to the facade of the location. And at the end of the day, it's the food and the service and the experience in the restaurant. That's what keeps people coming back. Not that little, little facade on the patio that we spent you know, $10,000 to move that wall for. So, uh, just, just a, a comment, to TK's credit. He is also the architect of the customer service at, at Veggie Grill, which in, uh, my, my wife was vegetarian for several years. I visit a lot of vegetarian restaurants. I, I've never, I was very impressed with the way they pulled off the, 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 the smile on, on the vegetarian restaurant. You know, because I visited enough to where I, I, I as a carnivore, uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't necessarily welcomed as much, but uh, walking into a Veggie Grill, you are absolutely welcomed, and, 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 and it's something that that, that smile is, is, is very pervasive, and I, I think it comes from TK. So branding is so important as soon as you walk through the door. All the way in the back. Can you talk about putting together a really great operational team, where you source your guys. I mean, essentially the folks who are taking care of the restaurant, the kitchen, and all that. Where do you source your, your talent, your people? You know, what percentage of your OPEX are you really comfortable with that taking? And then, I mean, I guess how, how critical that is to the success of your restaurant. Uh, for me, I have a pretty long network with uh, a lot of chefs who have worked under me over the years. So as we've grown, I've pulled them back into the fold. And they're guys who I trust, and they trust that I'm going to own their career, I'm going to take care of them. Uh, and it, it's worked out really well so far. Um, we have 100% retention over the last five years with management. I've, I've not lost a manager yet, um, and that's that's mostly because I think I have a I have a strong bond with these guys, and it flows both ways. Some of, some of our best people are the people that promote from within and move up through the company. And then once a once a server figures out they're not going to be a model actress for the rest of their life, <laughs> so we sell them the dream and you know real life, and uh, you know we move them up. And I think. Half of our restaurants now have general managers making you know six figures that uh, were servers, and they're the best because they have a culture. You know, versus hiring someone from another operation which comes in and they're set their own ways. We've been in business almost 27 years, so we've got the benefit of taking enough time to develop people over, over many many years to, so that they can be ready for the next door. Uh, and I think that that's a, a huge part of our success is that we we've got half our staff's been with us for over a decade and and a greater part of our management staff has been with us over 15 years so for we've just been the benefit of time in, in a lot of ways to be able to take take people develop them is there something in particular that you look for quality or something, especially when you're choosing somebody to run your kitchen for you what are you looking for i mean besides culinary skills people skills uh you they've got to like people you know and, and this is a people business from the top to the bottom to the back to the front every corner of the wall, they have got to like people and, and they have got to be able to treat people well. Anything else you want to add on that? What sets you apart makes you successful? It's such a challenging industry. How do you, how do you, you know, what sets success apart from failure? 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I think that the way everybody has a different answer to that, I'm sure. It's, it's, it's uh, this morning's speaker talked a lot about passion uh, and what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And I think in the restaurant business, everybody here understands that very well. But I think that if there was an underlying uh, catchphrase, I would say, you do whatever it takes to, to make it work every single day. And, and when you stop doing whatever it takes to make it work, then you exit the business. Uh, but right now, everybody here, I, I guarantee you, has had days where they've had tough days. But you do whatever you need to do to make it happen, to make it work. And, and, and I think that some people get, uh, get there and they, they, don't want to, they don't want to continue. And I think the other people just sometimes we're, we don't know any better, so we, we push forward. You know? And so you just keep pushing forward. It can never be about you either. It has to be about your customer. And if you lose sight of your customer, you lose you lose your business. Yeah, I would say uh, you clearly have to have food that people enjoy and uh, an ambiance that people enjoy and service that uh, meets certain standards. But even then, the restaurant business is the most competitive business around. I mean, every corner you have a choice. So you've got to have something that's really compelling that people are willing to drive past other choices to get to. So uh, that's why a lot of restaurants fail. That's why over 50% of them fail. And so if anybody's thinking about a restaurant concept, you really have to think, is, you know, is this really compelling? You know, do, you know, do, you know, do the people in this community really need this, or do they already have it? And it's, you know, it's something you got to think about. Do you have anything you want to add to that? I'm good. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I had two questions. Um, one is directed to all of you. Um, how have you been uh, dealing with the rising food prices? And secondly, the second question is directed to TK. Um, I know you mentioned you're going to be having a grand opening this week. Can you talk a little bit about how you um, these grand openings to, to integrate the community around there? Well, did you want, why don't you start that question first? Sure, sure. Uh, so, uh, I said, I think I said opening, right? A grand opening. <laughs> and that's important because you can do it one, one or the other way. You can have a grand opening or an opening. Uh, we don't do grand openings, you know, the opening party, that kind of thing. We, uh, we focus more on, we invite all our neighbors to the surrounding area to come in and have a meal on us. And it's partly a training session for our staff. It also gets the buzz out. People try our food and they're usually pretty amazed. Uh, and, uh, and that builds the, the buzz. And uh, so, you know, there's different ways to do it, but that's the way we do it. And how have you been dealing with food costs? Uh, that's uh, in just a daily, weekly mm -hmm. struggle. You have to continue to stay on top of it, look at where your costs are and uh, what your menu items are and how you can continue to deliver the quality you, you want to deliver uh, at the, at, and then also meet your food cost goals. We've definitely tweaked some prices over the last year or six months, um, and we've definitely gotten more efficient since uh, the economy in end of 08, so in all ways. So we're already prepared for the food costs going up. Um, but most importantly, we just hired our first uh, vice president of purchasing. So we're now. It's somebody else's problem. That's the. Right. <laughs> yeah. no, he comes from a public company, and, and he's going to go out there and make deals. And, you know, for example, if you have a hundred uh, purveyors supplying you and you have to cut checks for each person, it costs money to cut each check. If we can get everyone to drop off at you know one distribution point and then distribute to us, we might cut one check. So that's an example of just like cutting 300 checks down to one. Um, and anyway, just making global deals. Um, we do exclusive contracts, we buy our beef six months out, et cetera, so on. So it's, it's constantly working with your partners and negotiating one against the other. Be on top of it. Sure. Uh, that's kind of two questions. One, I guess. You know, if you have multiple locations with it, which all of your businesses do, how do you really maintain the quality in all the locations since you can't actually be there most of the time? And two, uh, I guess like for Pequito Moss, I mean, you're a very successful business in the LA area. Why not expand further or, you know, either end up through franchises or your company owned? Yeah, I'll take the last question first. And, uh, the last question first is, um, you know, I, I I started Poquito Mas because I had a passion for what I wanted to do. I wanted to create my own restaurant, have my own life. As an entrepreneur, you're, you're constantly in that idea of 
freedom versus security, you know, freedom to do what you want to do versus security of a paycheck. Uh, and so when I created Poquito Mas uh, and then the, the other three, I didn't have a, an exit strategy and I still don't. Uh, this is what I do. This is what I like to do. Uh, this year we're taking six months off to where we're just looking at where we're at as a company. We've got 12 stores. We're going to slow down a little bit. We're going to reorganize. We're going back into all our stores right now, see where we got out of alignment while we were building the last two. And, and so sort of seeing if anything uh, got uh, tweaked a little bit. I think that as far as expansion, um, we don't have grand plans for expansion across the country at this time. Uh, I think that we know who we are. Uh, we're a local brand. Uh, we're going to stay a local brand uh, until an opportunity presents itself. But we're a wholly owned company, no VC money, uh, and we don't have any corporate debt, so we don't really need to expand unless there's an opportunity for us to expand. So that's at this point, that's where we sit. Uh, as far as, uh, what was your first question then? Just uh, like, you know, as you expand and have multiple locations, how do you really maintain the control? It's the, the people. You've got you to gotta get people, and again, the, the, we've got really good people in, at locations, and I think for those of you who have been to our locations, you know that the people there are generally very friendly. They, they, they like what they're doing. They've been doing it a long time. The longer you can keep an employee, the, the stronger your brand is going to be, I think, because, you know, and we do that through flexibility in a lot of ways with ours, but I think that uh, the longer you keep an employee and the longer you can go out and visit the locations yourself the, just to help maintain the energy. Um, we do all the normal things like shoppers reports or talk to our friends, to go to the restaurants or dine there ourselves and, and uh, you know, have meetings upon meetings. But uh, one, of the, one of the important things is all of our managers and our top chefs are all bonused on, you know, I can tell you how many people I interview that say they have a bonus program at their current employer. And I say, well, what's the bonus based on it that I don't know, I never got it. Mm -hmm. And um, but we actually do have. So you're like, that's that's how you know not to hire that person, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, because people don't wind up paying the bonus. It's weird. Anyway, so we have a poorly bonus program, and also our top guys have equity participation. So at the end of the month, when there's X dollars of profit, they get their percentage of that profit. So really, they're really tied to picking up that napkin off the floor and putting in the laundry. They're tied to the food consistency and quality, and they're bonused on all these things. And when it comes down to the bottom line, that's what it really shows. And so, you know, these guys, we have them treat the restaurant like an entrepreneurial business. You know, we're, we're corporate from the back end in the corporate office, and we have our CFOs and all that. But in the restaurant, it's a mom and pop operation run by a general manager. Okay. Because you have, you have, I mean, you span Southern California. There's no way you could be at all of your restaurants in a single day. So, how do you make sure with? You know what's going on at all. So to echo, uh, again, Kevin, it's all about the people. It's all about having an infrastructure that supports great general managers. Uh, so that's number one uh, priority for us as we grow is to be able to do that. And it's not easy. And so uh, promoting from within helps, but you've got to give people time to learn everything uh, you're about. And, uh, so yeah, we're also working on programs where we're going to recruit people from other uh, uh, with other backgrounds, and other restaurant backgrounds, and put them through our <coughs> programs. So we've got uh, those programs in place right now that are working well, but we know we need to uh, make them even better as we grow. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, uh, it's having the right people in the right place, and then. Uh, a clear incentive program. I, I, I think that's really strong. There are so many restaurant groups out there that uh, say they have a bonus program, and yeah, it just it gets blown off the table quarterly. Um, so we have a very transparent bonus structure that uh, that we review in P and L, and they know if they hit it or not. So it creates a real sense of uh, proprietorship. I love, I love that bonus program. Mm -hmm. Curious uh, for all members of the panel. You've obviously experienced um, different paths to where you are now. What would you say are your biggest needs at this point, and what are your thoughts going forward? Kevin, you, you addressed your, your plans, but for the rest of the panel, what are your thoughts going forward uh, as you think about trying to grow your business and take the next step? I think I've answered that question, but uh, you know, uh, I, I think my biggest need right now is good real estate. Uh, and, 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 and good people, uh, and that's, that's the next thing I need. Um, I think that that's what we're all looking for the same corner. Uh, you know, some of us want bigger boxes than other ones, but 
we're all looking for the next great location. Our biggest challenge is always finding the best general manager because when it all comes down to it, that's the person running the, the shop, and the buck stops there. And uh, you know, quality people. I mean, we're not, you know, a lot of them aren't educated. They didn't go to college. They didn't go to grad school. Um, you know, they maybe grew up through the kitchen, and now they're businessmen doing P&Ls with us. But uh, it's, it's tough to find great people. You know, it's a and it's a tough industry because you know, listen, you got young people, you got a lot of alcohol around. Well, maybe not all places, but um, you know, it's crazy things happen. In this business, and uh, it never surprises me anymore. That's, that's, the, that's the talent we want to be on. We want to hear the crazy stuff. The HR, the HR stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, our, our need really is about to, we've got seven restaurants now. We've got the systems in place that I think do a pretty good job at allowing us to run those seven, but our aspirations are to become a national brand and uh, uh, grow pretty quick, pretty aggressively. So, our biggest need is to develop all those systems. That are going to support that, and uh, uh, and we don't know how to do that. Uh, so we, uh, because we don't come from a restaurant background, we've never done it before. Uh, our partners who do have the restaurant background have never done it as well on that scale. Uh, and uh, you know, to Kevin's earlier point, you know, we, if if we wanted to just do what we're doing, we'd, we'd be happy and we could do it. Uh, but we decided to take that next step and try and. Uh, 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 build a, a large organization, so we brought on a CEO who has that experience, and uh, so his number one goal is to put in the people infrastructure, the location selection infrastructure. Um, uh, those are the two <coughs> biggest things that we're working on right now. Yeah, and we're probably we're going to wait until we open these other two restaurants so that the dust settle and regroup. Um, and if we decide to expand more aggressively, we'd probably be looking for a strategic partner, uh, a group that's already expanded nationally, um, has the capital and has the infrastructure and expertise to make that happen without us compromising our brand integrity. Um, we haven't made that decision to do it, so we're a little bit behind the veggie grill in, in those terms. but. Uh, if if we decide, uh, you know, pull the switch on that, then that's that's probably what we'll be looking for. We'll be uh, interviewing some people. Uh, I want to uh, get a question in here. What's the thing that you wish? Oh man, why didn't somebody tell me this ten years ago? What's the one thing you wish somebody had told you to do that you had to learn the hard way? My my father told me to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and you said you sometimes wish that you had done a lot no, of No, and I, and I do, because I mean, literally a third of my day is dealing with legal stuff, whether it's leases or contracts or negotiations or, or things that a, a law degree would definitely help you with. And the amount of money I spend on attorneys a year, it would have been worth it. So. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I did have to uh, echo some of that. I think that w when you're growing, you're... The, the challenge is to stay close to the food and to the people and to the customers. And uh, as you grow, it, it, that becomes a greater challenge because the paperwork is also growing at the same time. Whether it's HR issues or uh, legal issues or lease issues or uh, whatever, they, 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 there's a huge amount of paperwork that goes with it as you grow. And I think that the, the greatest challenge I'm finding is making sure that that doesn't take me too far away from the customer and too far away from the food because I like the food business. And simply managing a restaurant company isn't as much fun as being in the food business. And so I'm trying to stay in the food business. I wish somebody had told me uh, much earlier on uh, to, to create, um, um, uh, get a, a semi or get a law degree because you're right, we're always dealing with legal documents, but just how much um, uh, of a challenge that would be so that I could have uh, planned a little bit better. I think we've got it under control right now, but that's the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles right now is to maintain the, the, the uh, proximity to the food and to the people. Um, I would say I, I learned a lot of my, entrepreneur, my entrepreneurial lessons in my last business where we bootstrapped it early on and did everything from uh, cleaning, you know, cleaning, cleaning the floors to coding the websites to selling it and all that stuff. So, um, you know, what I learned there is uh, as you grow, you've got to continually change your role and learn how to uh, adapt to other people doing things you used to do and uh, 
putting in the right infrastructure so you become more of a manager than an actual uh, uh, doer of things. Because if you really want to grow, you can't do it all. So you've got to make sure you've, you, you can manage people and give them the right guidelines and, and then let them do it without stepping, stepping over and taking, taking control. Right, I think the hardest thing starting out is to look at a, uh, everybody was telling us get a good attorney. Um, and then we would look at the hourly rates and we said, that's okay, we got this. We'll figure it out. And then a year or two years later, you realize you didn't have it and you weren't protected. And you're in a bad lease or you're in a bad situation. So uh, we always used to joke, someday we'll have a team of attorneys and we now have a team of attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are some of the strategies you use for um, some of the locations that are struggling? You know, some of your locations are in other premier spots, whatever. Some aren't doing as well. So, what do you guys do to enhance those? Doesn't spots? apply to any of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got I've got two locations in Vegas, and Vegas has obviously had its had its uh, moments in the last couple of years. You know, where hotel rooms went from five hundred dollars a night in Venetian to you know one hundred nineteen dollars a night. So you have to do things that normally you wouldn't do. And I remember when I first uh, went to Vegas four years ago to open up. I remember seeing. Uh, you know, taxi cabs driving with like advertising in the back. And I turned to one of my partners, I said, I will never put an ad in the back of a taxi cab. Well, now we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you do what you gotta do. And uh, you get creative and you try different things and you see what works and, and you have to be open because, you know, it, things are moving so fast that you have to be willing to uh, move quickly and, and try different things. Well, some panel want to address that? Uh, I mean, I would say, you know, in terms of building sales, it's exactly what Lee said. You got to get creative. You got to know what uh, works for your brand and try different things and uh, continually work on uh, what what makes sense for what you're doing. So this is a question for all of you: What percentage of your business is sustained by returning customers? And second question. How do you accurately measure how many times a person or a patron has been to your establishment? We, we don't uh, measure. Uh, I, I can tell you just from the first seven years I was behind the counter uh, at the first restaurant. And so my measurement was visual. Uh, and when we have a weekly managed meeting where we talk about our customers and what I'm going to, uh, I think I believe our customers, just from what we get from American Express reports, and some of the other matrices that we can look at. There's about 85%, 90% returning customers uh, at, at most of our stores. And I think that um, uh, as far as actual measurement, we don't have a, um, uh, a card that measures the, the, the recurrence. We do look at customer counts. And we know if we're doing better this year than last year in customer counts, we're heading in the right direction. Dollar volume won't always tell you that because you could have different variations there. But I look at customer counts. We have more customers this year than last year at that store, at lunch, at dinner. So. Our, our restaurants in LA are probably 80% locals, 20% let's say tourists or transient. Uh, Vegas and Scotts would be pretty much the opposite. So in LA, how do we track it? We can track it through open table mainly, you know, the reservation system, and you can see exactly how many, you know, how many times you've been or not been. Um, and you can also American Express does some amazing statistics for you and can track all kinds of things for you. Um, you know, word of mouth is the most important thing. So, you know, we've never done like a dining club or whatever, but, uh, but uh, you know, we're all about locals in LA, word of mouth. TK? Uh, so we, uh, we do not uh, have a way to track uh, repeat versus new customers. Uh, so we don't, we don't have that data. Uh, we can guess at it based on visual, uh, just visual walking around the restaurant, talking to people. Uh, but, uh, uh, we do. Uh, we did do. A, we did hire a firm that uh, did a survey for us uh, amongst our existing uh, database people who join our birthday club, and they're in our database. Did a survey, uh, learned about the frequency of our guests and how many come once a week, how many come once a month. So we have that data. And so a lot of this is is all based off of like American Express reports or Open Table, like individual platforms that allow them to create metrics around their platform to give you guys information, but. Like American Express, you guys get those, those uh, analytics from them if they use an American Express card. But right. how much business is done in cash? And, and that's not tracked, or that patron's not tracked because they didn't use right. that or they didn't book through the table. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's 
probably opposite for you guys, but we're probably 80, 90 percent credit cards. And you know, a good percentage of that's going to be American Express. So you know, yeah, American Express, Visa, Mastercard. I meet with American Express; they have the best metrics. I meet with them, and you can kind of see what what the plan is. So in the restaurant business, um, you have a table of four, or, or you have bottle service, or something. Someone usually puts on one card, but there's say eight patrons linked to that actual thing. So there's no way to measure. True. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, it's it's an art, not a science necessarily in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was. Joke would be more fun to sell maybe like toothpicks or hangers because you could tweak one little thing and see how it affects it, but we're not doing that. So, you know, you raise a price or you lower a price, you know, for us, there's no way to know, unless you're the size of McDonald's or something, how that really affected your sales. That's why I say it's an art. I think it's a great point you make, just that it, it is, it is, um, it's a, the art part of it is the people part. <coughs> you know, keeping our managers on the floor, talking to people, engaging the customer rather than in an office analyzing reports. I think that's that, that's one of the, the, the keys to what we do is, is that we're trying to stay in touch. Data is you can you can uh, you can do so much data that you'll never you'll never be able to analyze it all. So the only thing we we I, we look at key numbers that that we think will have an impact on us. Yeah. So this question is maybe a little bit more for those of you who have been in business a little bit longer. In terms of what do you see in terms of how customers what they're looking for in terms of value, how that may be changing, especially since the financial crisis and the, and the economy, um, if you have any comments on that. Um, about two years before the financial crisis, we introduced something called Petitos, which are smaller versions of our top selling items because uh, we noticed that uh, people were splitting food because our portions were so big. And so what we noticed <coughs> the economy turned down, those Petito items went up. And people started ordering those, so they may have traded down one of the same flavor. They traded down to do a smaller version of the same thing. The next thing they did is they looked. If we looked at uh, beverages, they're looking at whether or not they, could, they would order water rather than, than a soda or something. So you, you see, definitely, you see a, a value conscious person. They're ordering different things. They may not be ordering the same size thing. We have the multiple portions, so they have that flexibility. Uh, we lucked out on that one because we did we designed it for purely for people's ability to not eat as much uh, if they didn't want to, but get the same flavor. I think that uh, everybody's value conscious a little bit different. Uh, we my biggest thing we see in customers right now is um, I think that the big parties that were there uh, are coming back right now. They they went away for a little while. The big catering orders went away for about six months and, uh, and from October of 08, whenever the, uh, the, the fear of, of, of doom was put across the, the airways. Uh, and then those are, those are coming back right now. So they're, but they're still, everybody's value conscious right now. We're a no tipping place, so that helps us out too. So that's uh, it was something that was a benefit. I think everyone's spending less nowadays, for sure, no matter how much money you have. But um, you know, we've always designed our menus to have offerings for different people. So while the check average of a sushi roku might be fifty bucks, you can get out of there for twenty five if you come in and have you know California roll and a miso soup, or you can spend hundred dollars a person by having farm raised bluefin tuna at forty dollars for you know, four slices. So you can definitely make your own price point, and we, we that way we get in, you know, we can't take care of everyone. Yeah. Nothing Chipotle next to us or across the street in four out of the five restaurants. Um, <laughs> we, were, uh, we were there first, uh, three out of the four. Um, they had an impact on us uh, one day in Culver City uh, because they were giving out free burritos. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I don't know that we share customers. We also have uh, Panera. Uh, in just as many markets. Um, and again, I think we're different enough that they don't really in impact us. Plus, I think uh, in the case of Panera, uh, not to 
saying the thing negative, but they uh, they don't have maybe the ethics or or, or uh, sort of um, soul that a uh, maybe a Chipotle does. Chipotle really does elevate uh, their experience, both in terms of design and um, and their product. You know, they've gone pretty heavily organic, um, which sort of is a shared philosophy that we have, which would draw some of maybe our customers away, or they'd go to Chipotle one day and kind of greens the next. Um, but so far, they haven't impacted us at all. As a matter of fact, sometimes it brings more traffic to the corner, and it's good. Sure. Yeah, we're, uh, we're next to a Chipotle, but they were there first, and we went next to them because of what Eric just said. Uh, in the restaurant world, if you've got a good restaurant that's differentiated, uh, then you want to be near other good restaurants because diners come in, they don't eat at the same place every day. So if you've got something that is differentiated, compelling, then uh, you'll be part of the rotation. We haven't been impacted by Chipotle at this point. Uh, they're a darn good brand. They know what they're doing. They build beautiful restaurants. Uh, uh, they, they've got a great following. Um, we've been around a long time in this neighborhood, and so Perhaps the, the, the our longevity gives us a little bit of an edge, uh, aside from what I would consider differentiations on, on, on products. But I think that, uh, that any new brand that comes in, if, if it's, it's going to have different marketing techniques, whether it's free burritos or whatever, you know, you're going to be impacted by that a day or two. But but the long term impact really comes down to whether or not you know if your customers coming in, you're giving them a reason to stay or if you're inspiring to, to your food, or if you're going to leave them uninspired and then therefore they might go somewhere else. In the back of the blue. Um, this question is for Jin and Lee. Um, as, you, uh, as both of you don't have experience in the restaurant industry before, so what do you think is the key skills that uh, is required, are required in this industry? So I would say from my perspective, you have to have a partner that, uh, that was involved because there's so many details to this business. Uh, you just can't do it without having a partner who, uh, who, who knows the details of it. So I was lucky enough to find a good partner. I do the same exact thing. You know, I, I have a friend who's actually one of the founders of uh, Shakey's Pizza and Taco Bell and, uh, and BJ's Brew Pub, that's what it's called. And he said, uh, he said, and he's a very wealthy guy, and he said, Lee, you know, I've, I've never rolled a taco or made a pizza, but I know how to make money. <laughs> and, you know, it's hiring the right people. And uh, when I... 13, 14 years ago when we did Sushi Roku, you know, I didn't know much about sushi other than, you know, going out to run and sushi bars. But I knew the best sushi bar in town was the Matsuhisa. And I went in there and I scouted out who the general manager was and did some research, found out he was there for five years, called him between lunch and dinner the next day and I said, uh, I need to meet with you. And he said, why? I said, I need to meet with you tomorrow. And he came and met with me and he later on tells a story, he thought it was like a shakedown, like a mafia thing. But, um, <laughs> and so he was my Japanese guy. So I, I brought in someone who could bring in the chefs and design the menu and teach the Japanese culture. And it's, it's putting the right people together. And we still do the same thing. I'm, I'm working on an Italian concept right now. Italian's very, very competitive. I know Italian food, but we need to go one step further. So I'm going to look for a, a star Italian chef. <coughs> Going back to the theme you said earlier, uh, it seems like having a law degree is, is, is very useful in the industry. Well, for the two Anderson alums, well, what did you get um, out of your, your, your MBA? How did, how did that help you? I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you took the class that was called the Internet back then. <laughs> I thought you to plug into this weird thing. Black and white. Um, you know, I mean, you know, you guys still work in groups, little teams. I mean, that was a great experience working with teams and, and learning the diversity of people and how to work together and use different people's talent. You know, I was kind of usually on the phone, so I was relying on other people. Um, working under pressure, I went to the FEMA program, so I was super busy working, opening up a place, and going to school. So it was definitely learning to uh, have a lot of balls in the air. Um, specific classes, I'm sure things here and there, um, you know, accounting and whatnot, but. Uh, I think the overall experience and, and, and you know, becoming an adult. <laughs> I would say there's a lot of things about being an entrepreneur that uh, you don't learn in business school. You just have to go out and do it and learn and just figure it out. 
the thing that I think really did help with the veggie grill was the, the branding and marketing fundamentals. You get to learn uh, what really helped us with looking at it from a, from that perspective. What do we want to create? What is what are the attributes and uh, really taking more of a framework, fundamental approach to it, and then doing everything to bring it to life. We have about 12, 13 more minutes left. So let's try to power share as many questions as possible. Over here. Um, you mentioned incentive programs that were hollow. They never materialized for other companies. How, did you see those companies then suffer because of that? And then all of a sudden that, that target starts to move or it fades away or um, you know, in the case of, let's say, a hotel, uh, rooms division didn't do very well, so sorry, you're, you're not going to uh, make your bonus, even though you made it. Uh, it becomes a, a real real problem, and very quickly you start looking for a, a better habitat. Hey, guys, I lied. <laughs> Lane, the liberal media, uh, we are out of time. <laughs> so contact me if you have any, any questions that I might be